So I will be sharing with you today the highlights of a continuous deployment summit that we ran at Facebook in July. But before, I, I want to um, just let you know, so I am a professor of computer science at NC State University. So I teach for a living, and I know how quickly your attention span drifts away. Um, and so what I find, it, it works out much better if we can all have more of a conversation rather than me just presenting the whole time. So I do encourage you to interrupt me, ask a question, share an experience. You know, I'll try to be managing time as we go. Um, but, but I really would like this to be as conversational as possible. Um, as Max mentioned, I will be downstairs from now to the end of your workday, and I would love for you to stop by, share your experiences really with anything that we talk about today, in particular pair programming, because you know, that is an interest of mine, and I know that you do it a lot here. And I'd like to hear your experiences, good, bad, and ugly with it. Um, so please do stop by. All right, so I'll go ahead and get started. <clears throat> um, just what we'll talk about today, first of all, is what is continuous deployment? And then um, I'll share, like I said, some information about the summit. I guess this is too close. Let me try a little further away. Um, the summit that we had uh, um, this July. Um, an overview, some uh, the benefits and challenges with the continuous deployment, and then most of the presentation will be on what we call the 10 adages that came out of the summit, and then we'll talk about limitations and open questions. Um, so first to start out with, what is continuous deployment? And, and you may already know this already, but just to, to kind of uh, take a level set, and, and really when I think about, so I have been doing research in the Agile area since 1998, so long time. Some of you were like in grade school at that point. Um, and, you know, what I see as continuous deployment is really just, you know, turning the dials even further. Um, and so with continuous deployment, you know, th there's a lot of automation. So um, code, unit test, integration, code review, and through deployment, just automating all the way through. Um, rapidly getting code out to customers, getting feedback for the next cycle. Um, and you know, so the, the scale is um, deploying in minutes, hours, days, so the time scale goes way down. Um, we're used to deploy you know, once a year, once every two years, now you're deploying continuously. Um, and so that, that's the level set. Um, uh, some things that got me interested in, you know, re, you know resurging the, the research in this area were some statements made by leaders and companies. So this was in late 2014. I saw a couple quotes. Um, the first one was Brian Stevens from Red Hat. Um, and he said, the legacy model of software engineering just isn't going to survive this transition. Um, and then Satya at Microsoft talked about how their whole company was moving to a continuous delivery model. And so, you know, from an educator and researcher standpoint, I thought, wow, there, there is a very big transition underway. And from, as an educator, are we even teaching the right things to students anymore if this is the way that, that um, things are going to go? So um, we got the planning going for what we call the Continuous Deployment Summit that we held at, on the Facebook campus just one day in July. We had one representative from 10 different companies um, and you know, I'll just kind of give you an overview of them and, um, you know, what kind of state they were in. And so one thing I want you to note when I go through this, that there's a range of um, different maturity. Well, first of all, continuous deployment is not a mature process. Um, and then within these companies, we intentionally wanted a range of um, companies that were really, you know, engrossed in continuous deployment started that way, didn't have to make a transition to companies that were really big monolithic architecture kind of project, uh, uh, products that were transitioning. We wanted to get the whole range. So like Microsoft is one of the companies that really within their own company has the range. So um, Bing, they deploy all the time. Where Windows is actually starting to be um, deployed more often, particularly changes. And so they've had a multi-year transition um, and, you know, th so they see the practices of continuous deployment. In some cases, the practices are feasible, and sometimes, in some ways, they're not feasible, but they're trying to do it as much as possible. Um, Netflix, highly, um, you know, they deploy something like 60,000 times a day, so I'd call them um, far up. 
from Google as well. Um, Facebook de definitely has a lot of the practices in play. Um, I put Instagram under them. Instagram is a Facebook company, um, but they did a keynote, so we got a perspective of both Facebook and Instagram. Um, LexisNexis is actually a company. I'm in, in North Carolina, and they're on our Centennial campus, so they're a partner of mine. Um, they develop, the, the, the office near us anyway, develop software to support lawyers. Um, I'll, I'll say they're low in the continuous deployment journey. Um, SAS, the statistical software company, also low in their journey. They have large enterprise customers, of, by definition, lots and lots and lots of data at customer locations. So their transition is a slow one, but they desire to do it. Um, Cisco is also um, relatively slow. I, I'd say Mozilla kind of in the middle. Um, they have six, use a lot of the practices, but release about once every six weeks. Um, Red Hat in some of their products, um, moving towards continuous deployment. And then also IBM is kind of in a range. You know, um, the, the um, Blue Mix people that you work with, deploying much more often, and then they have uh, enterprise projects um, that take much longer. And so we, we, as I said, intentionally tried to get a whole range of different perspectives. Um, but we all came together, the purpose of coming together was to share best practices and challenges with the eye towards everyone improving. And so even, you know, say Netflix, Google, Facebook, that do a lot of the practices, they still have a lot of challenges, and they were still learning from each other. Um, so I'll share those experiences with you. Any questions so far? All right, we need the icebreaker question pretty soon, so start forming it, okay? All right, so for, um, first thing I'll talk about are the benefits that the companies say they realize from continuous deployment. Um, one is employee satisfaction. So in general, people did like it better. Um, they're happier because they're always getting their changes out. They're getting feedback on their changes. And, and um, the changes that they make are becoming visible. So they, rather than if you have a change and then three months now or six months from now, it's in the product, they were getting it in the product right away. Um, they did feel like they had reduced stress because if they didn't catch this release train, they could get the next one. If they didn't finish this morning, maybe they can get this afternoons. And so that, that helped out their stress level. Um, you know, on, on the flip side, and we'll talk about later, you know, there's, there's uh, more stress in some dimensions as well. Um, another benefit was delivery, consistency, and speed. You know, getting changes out there all along um, was a benefit. Um, decisions were easier to make because they were typically making smaller decisions. They were data-driven. The feedback loops were tight. They just did something. They were getting feedback on it. Um, they felt like they were being more productive um, in general. But they had some challenges as well. And, you know, again, even the companies that um, have employed a lot of, you know, have 60,000 deployments a day, they have some of these same challenges. Um, so some deployment pain points, you know, most of the, you know, the first three bullets are, are really saying, you know, if you have a big database schema change, um, you have a lot of data in, you know, on a database, stateful server, those kinds of, how do you deploy rapidly then? Um, how, how long can you take a, a customer down in order for, to make that change? Um, another deployment pain point are users that don't want updates all the time. And in some cases, you know, there's no choice. I think in, in your case, you do have some customers that have on-premises products, and they can choose or not choose to take an update. But a lot of the products that are out there, there's no choice. You know, your app's on your phone and, and whatnot. Like, you're going to get the change. And so dealing with customer resistance. Um, and then version dependencies can be a challenge where you have different libraries and, and different products you're integrating with and, and having different versions of that. Um, some adoption pain points. One of the things that make employees not as happy is um, there can be a cradle-to-grave ownership. So the developer also is the person who answers the phone when there's a problem um, and tests and does everything in between. And that, you know, a lot of people don't like that as much. Some do, but a lot of people don't. Um, pr process and tool consolidation, so within an organization, um, maybe there's a convergence where 
before each team had a lot of autonomy with their choices of tools, but now um, not as much because, because they're trying to rapidly move together. They're consolidating on their choices. Um, Cross-team collaboration and communication has to increase, um, so there's some challenges with that. Um, and then from a skill set, uh, there are more, like you need to more be a generalist. So if you're going to be an architect and a developer and a tester and a deployer, you, know, there's a di you have to have a general skill set. Um, one thing that was interesting to me um, as I was disseminating the data um, for this summit was that everyone at the summit, all 10 companies, people wrote the notes of what went on. And so as I read Google's notes and Netflix notes and Facebook's notes, I could see what was important to them. And one thing that everyone wrote down was Facebook says generalists over specialists. They all thought that was interesting. And um, so, you know, it's, it's something that in the future, you know, people should keep in mind. Also, some testing pain points. Um, test execution time, so tests can take a long time. Um, test flakiness. Everyone complained about test flakiness where you know, I would define that as sometimes a test runs and passes and sometimes it fails. Um, and it's very hard to deal with a situation like that. Um, and all of, everyone had that kind of a, an issue. Um, and you know, there was things that like a voting, like if it runs two out of three times, we call it a pass, that kind of thing. Um, testing variations, different platforms. I know that that's an issue that you deal with as well. Um, and the time to write automated tests. Um, and then some technology barriers to option to, uh, that you need to deal with. Companies that had monolithic architectures had to start breaking the architecture up over time. Um, technical debt that can inhibit automation. So if you have a lot of technical debt, that can be a problem. And then finally, working with existing infrastructure. So that's, those are the, the costs and challenges. Definitely a good time for someone to have a question. Yeah, so. Okay. So, going back to the companies that attended, I know a little bit about Mozilla and Google with respect to Chrome. So, what was it, about 10 years ago that Chrome came out? And at that time, Mozilla was naming their Firefox releases. They gave them names like Bon Echo and Gran Paradiso or Phone Show and Grand Paradiso. And they were saying, and making great ceremony around their releases. And Google came out with Chrome, and Chrome has these numbered uh, meaningless, phonetically meaningless uh, releases. And was there a lot of competitive pressure from the release of Chrome and the success of this upgrade, continuous upgrade model, continuous deployment model, that factored into Firefox moving to a more of it? And did they discuss any of the problems that they encountered in that process? Right. Um, so I would say we did not discuss that specific history. But I will say that competitive advantage and keeping up with your competitors absolutely was discussed. So um, that, that may have been the first instance, instance of that. But yeah, I would, I would say highly likely that's exactly what happened. And but Mozilla is saying six weeks, so maybe it's not as big splash. And, and we see, you know, I have a Firefox user, so I see updates probably more than once every six weeks, but those are probably more critical updates. But um, Mozilla is not nearly as what Chrome, what Chrome is now. You had a question as well? Uh, Same one, right? What oh, was that? I figured it out of my head. Oh, come on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah? Um, well, I mean, some of the challenges like, you know, um, employee burnout, I guess, was discussed. Um, from a technical standpoint, I don't think anyone talked about a technical negative. Yeah. So I would say employee burnout was probably the only thing that came up as like an outwardly like negative thing that they had to deal with. Any other questions? All right. 
So now I'm going to go into the 10 adages of continuous deployment, and hopefully that will embody a lot of the findings that um, we had. So the first adage um, in continuous deployment is every feature is an experiment. And so what that, that is really meant to say that when a feature is put out in a product, that now there's data that would support the decision to keep that feature in a product. So a lot of instrumentation by design would be put into the product. There would be questions about the success of that feature, the willingness to change the feature, and the willingness to take it out if it doesn't appear to be working. Um, and so it really, the extent of that varies. So, um, you know, one of the, like, you know, the extreme example is Netflix. So Netflix is experimenting with all of us all the time. If you're just hovering over something, that's an experiment. I mean, they're experimenting with every aspect of the user interface. And they're moving things around on the screen all the time based upon feedback. Um, you know, so that's kind of an extreme example, but you know, in, in all cases, everyone is saying that experiments are continuously going on. Um, and the important thing with these experiments is to have like, the key business measures. So Netflix said that the key, their key business metri measures are how many people are signing up per second and how, you know, how, what's the, the amount of uh, bytes that are being streamed right now. Those are the key, key metrics. They're continuously measuring them, and the experiment, ultimately, that's the measure. There might be some other secondary measures, but they're always looking at the key measures. So because of all of this experimentation that's going on, a lot of telemetry, a lot of instrumentation, um, data scientists, I'm not sure how many data scientists you have, but some of the companies said now a third of their organization are data scientists. That's, that's a lot of people. Um, lots of data, terabytes of data, and then how much data they're collecting now becomes a problem because they're collecting so much of it. Um, very complex queries. You know, said, you know, we need a PhD to write the query to digest the data to get the answer to your question. Um, and very careful planning. So it was very disheartening when they would collect a whole bunch of data for an experiment and then realize they left one key data element out and then they had to redo the experiment. So, you know, some things that they need to, to care about with that was privacy implications. Some of the products, there was privacy implications of the data, um, managing the overhead and making sure they're not impacting the customer because of the experiments that they're running, <clears throat> and also instrumenting the experiments and then tearing down the experiments. So taking the instrumentation away. It becomes technical debt if the instrumentation for the experiment stays there forever. All right, questions on that one? That was a lot. Yeah? Why was it such a big deal if they left out a variable? Couldn't they just get that variable again with that? Yeah, but that means that they have to you know, re restart everything. That's all. It's not that big of a deal, but if they thought they were going to get some information and do it, they might say, well, now we have to start again. And you know, so in some cases, they may only care about a day's worth of data, but if they wanted to track something over a longer period of time and then they left it out, then you know, they'd have to start it all over again. Other questions? All right, so that's the first adage. Um, the next one is the cost of change is dead. <clears throat> so I don't know how many of you are software engineers. You know, Barry Baim is someone, um, he's a professor at uh, uh, USC down in LA, and way back in the 70s, he came out you know, with, with the chart on the left that was, says, if you find a defect later in the development process, the cost goes up essentially exponentially. So if you find a requirements defect you know, in production, it costs a thousand times you know, more to fix it than if you found it in the requirements phase. And so you know, we've all, as software engineers, been, you know, make sure you get things right so you don't go too far down that curve. Where with um, continuous deployment, you know, the cost of change is dead. So if you do something today, you deploy it today, you find out you had a problem, you can fix it. Or, you know, you create a build problem and the build breaks, but you fix it. You know, so it's, it, things are quite um, rapid. So you, know, you don't have to worry about it quite as much. Um, some things to think about with that, though, is say you deploy something today and... Three months from now, you find a problem with it. 
So then the cost of change goes back kind of to the traditional because now you're like, what, was, what would cause that? How could, when, you know, what did we do three months ago? And so, you know, you're back to that cost of change, but you would also have to think about at that time, well, nobody did that for three months, so do we really need to fix it? It's obviously a low usage path. Maybe it's not critical. Maybe we leave it as is. Um, but some other considerations like I have down at the bottom, um, the cost of a customer is not dead. So there was some conversation around the fact that for some of the people at the summit, you know, the fact that maybe they're a little bit annoyed. So say you're a Gmail user, for example. You don't pay anything for Gmail. So if they lose you, then maybe they're not losing a lot. There's billions of customers. So if, if they make you mad with an experiment because the button you expected to be on the right is now on the left or whatever it is, not so much. But, you know, an enterprise company like SaaS, like experimenting with the enterprise customers, that cost of losing a customer is um, much bigger. So much more willing to experiment with customers when losing a customer um, is not as great. Um, and then the other thing that, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, is that um, in some cases the cost of a defect can be non-critical in other cases depending upon domain where in, in a certain domain if the cost of a defect is somebody's life then you know you, you may have to have different processes than just you know that Netflix has or, or Google has. <clears throat> Um, fast to deploy, slower to release. And so what this is saying is that you can continuously put changes out into your code base, but slower to release to your customer. So the customer doesn't know the changes are taking place. So two, um, two ways you can do that. One is what's called a dark launch, um, and the other is feature flags. And I'm guessing that you already use feature flags, but Dark launch, in case that's not part of your vocabulary already, it's really saying that you can be deploying changes all along, making changes to the code base, potentially even large architectural changes, um, but as long as you don't put it into the user interface, the user doesn't know that it's happening, so not visible to the user. Um, feature flags is a way that you can do that as well. Um, that is done when a change is large, like a whole architecture, perhaps. Um, and you can be changing an architecture, and most of the, the traffic would be going under the old architecture, but you are able to test the new architecture in a production environment. Um, and so there's really two benefits. One is making sure the changes are stabilizing, they're compiling, they're doing you know, everything they need to do, but also it enables it, you to test at scale. So you may, the customer may not be seeing any of the side effects of the new code, but maybe whatever the new code is doing, you're allowing it to do and you're collecting data on it and potentially even running test cases on it at scale. Um, <clears throat> and th there was just a, a lot of talk about using this as a testing strategy and um, that you wouldn't have this um, shadow infrastructure, you wouldn't have to have a test environment set up for testing, you'd be able to do all your testing at scale, even though the customers don't know that it's happening. Um, and, you know, just some notes there, it can be error prone, so you really have to watch the configuration to make sure that this happens smoothly, um, that, that you're doing two things at the same time, one the customer knows about, one only you know about, and also that you properly tear that down at the right time. So if you do switch over to the new functionality, the new architecture, that the old stuff is, is correctly ripped out. You must have some quick, qu yeah, go ahead. Are there any hydro patterns in this? Like where you, where you, where you stay with your, uh, your accepted cascaded model, right? Um, but also fast track some um, say it some more. Have, so, there, have, have you seen patterns where people uh, apply both models? For, like, so for mainline stuff, you go through the traditional release process, uh, but some things get fast tracked or something. Yeah, um, so I'll say um, two things. So um, depends upon the criticality. So um, yeah, we'll talk about privacy and security later, but there can be some changes that are critical that might go through a traditional path with traditional QA and, and much more careful review. 
that would go through a traditional path and then others. Yeah, so, so yes, right. And then also with this, um, so is just a staging deployment? Um, so canary deployment, you know, there's a, a lots of different terms with it. So when you make a change, there might be, you know, in some cases, companies can do dog food testing, you know, so they're first deploying it to their own company. And if that goes okay, they'll put, you know, 1% of the traffic and then 5% of the traffic and 10% of the traffic and then all of the traffic. So um, reducing the risk of that. Um, some of the companies with that had, like some might say, okay, you know, randomly 1% goes and randomly 5% goes. But in a lot of cases, there was a lot more intelligence that went behind it and a lot of more intelligence that went into the feature flags so that the the 1% was a targeted 1%. The 5% was a targeted 5%. Um, so they knew who, who they wanted to send it to. Okay. Any more questions about this? No? All right. Um, a next adage is investing for survival. And so it, the only way that anyone could, you know, any of the companies could accomplish deploying, you know, 60,000, 4,000 times a day, or even in some cases six weeks or just more often, was a big investment in tooling and automation. So, like, you know, automated testing, that's an investment on the developer's part or on the tester's part. Um, code review support, um, code review now being either static analysis tools or could be just code review like tools so that you could easily review your colleagues code from your computer um, you know, rather than sitting in a room in a traditional way having a code inspection. Um, release automation, process enforcing automation, feature experiment automation, so a, a lot of automation. And one thing as an aside, the code review support part, um, one of the things that, that we're seeing that it was evident and when I talked to companies as well as at the summit is that there's a lot of what I'll just call good software engineering practices like code review, like test automation, you know, test-driven development, code, uh, unit testing and whatnot that, you know, as particularly as an educator, um, I'd be telling, you know, people you really need to do that and I do consulting as well, you know, you need to do pair programming, you need to do, and, and resistance to it. And now with continuous deployment, it seems like people do code review, people do testing, like, test automation because you have to. And so it's, it's a way that I'll say good software engineering practices are being prot, brought in to the process because people know if I, rather than I, I'm going to throw it over the wall and maybe someday testers will find something, maybe they won't, now they're like, customers are going to see this today. I better make sure it's okay. Um, and so, you know, every aspect of the process is automated does take a lot of investment. Yeah. Uh, and sometimes uh, people saying that you know, you're doing pair programming and um, a lot of code review, you hear you guys are having like, on the spot for people who are comparing. Um, I'm just curious what your opinions on that are. Like, I don't want to add a team on one right now, like we are going to do a code review unless we have some pretty big things we have to do about it. Right. Yeah, no, so I'd say that that trade-off between pair programming and code review has been around. So like, like uh, Max said, I did publish a book about it and I've done research. And so back in 2000, 2001, um, companies were explicitly making that trade-off, saying you either pair program or code review. And so I think that, you know, it, that what's going on here is definitely a case of that as well. And so your choice to code review, you said, is you know, far and few between and, and really important or complex code. Is that, yeah. Any other questions? All right, um, this one, you are the support person. So um, in a lot of continuous deployment environments, as I mentioned before, there's a cradle to grave kind of situation where you write the code, you do everything, you test it, you, get, you take the call. And there's a, a bunch of variations of that. And in some cases, that just means forever. If you wrote it, you do everything to it. Um, the next is some kind of a rotation. So um, in some cases it's called a shield team, um, but it would to say these are the people now that are going to take the calls for our team, and that will shield the rest of us so we can all continue development um, without interruption. Um, so that's one way, and I would say that's 
a common. I mean, in some cases, it's yours forever. In, other, in more cases, it was a rotation where the developers always were part of the rotation and learning about being a support person. Um, and so it did build you know, empathy and you know, sharing the pain, if you will. Um, but there's also were ways to kind of you know, improve the situation. So companies that had large monolithic architectures were developing microservices, which means people were able to isolate themselves and their changes more. Um, integrated teams where all of the skills needed were within the same team. Um, some API standards um, that, that could help out as well. And just in general, social contracts. So a very high level of expectation among your team members that you're going to put good code in and you're not going to put in code that breaks the build and holding each, everyone to a high standard. But all in all, this made everyone have a much more, you know, a bigger view, a more broad view about the impact of their changes on the, you know, the big picture of the product. All right. Um, the next one is configuration is code, um, which is kind of a variation of infrastructure as code. Um, and what this is saying is that the, you know, the changes, so the, the experiments that are underway, the different types of testing that are going on is very complicated. Um, and so um, you can, you know, things like setting feature flags, setting the, making the set, settings, what are the experimental values, what metrics are going to be collected are all different complex things that are going on. And if you don't manage them well, you could break the build, you could break a deployment. And so using the same kind of tools like Puppet, Chef, Salt, that are used in the infrastructure as code, which is a, a repeatable way of setting configurations, um, you would use to manage the, kind of that lower level of configuration that goes on um, due to the way that continuous deployment works. So the new normal is to set these configurations as code and to have version control with those and measure dependencies and cohesion and coupling and all kinds of things um, and reviewing them potentially as well. Any questions? Um, comfort the customer with discomfort. Um, I mentioned before the, the fact that you know, now as customers, you know, we get changes. And, it, and we get changes on our phone, we get changes on our operating systems. You know, we're, we're just thrown changes at us. Customers don't always want that. So here's, here's some examples. Like on the bottom left is a banking application. And you, know, you want to get your money. You want to transfer some money. You want to do something with your money. And instead you get a message that says you need to upgrade your app. So like you can't even get to your money unless you upgrade the app. I mean that can, that can cause little distress. Um, this is the Windows 10, you know. Pretty much you need to upgrade to Windows 10. Um, and at the top is, uh, is um, Tesla. And so, you know, car owners need to upgrade their software. So there's a message on the screen that they need to upgrade the software, which is not something that car owners are used to. But Tesla does push changes out like that. And so, you know, as customers, we are becoming more, you know, used to this kind of thing. What will happen when we're all, you know, working in enterprises? Maybe we'll be more likely to accept changes all the time because we're used to doing it um, in our own environments all the time. But, you know, from enterprise customers, those are the ones who typically will have um, the biggest challenges. Um, and so some of the strategies, the enterprise companies, the SaaSes, IBMs, Microsoft, um, the, what they talked about was, you know, involving them in the process, co-inventing with them, and then especially the focus was on making the process easier, so making the data transitions easier. Um, the IBM person that was there talked about like the product that he was working on, which was a, a database project, that it used to be that to have a new release, the customer had to be down for a month for that new release to take place, and they got it down to an hour. So, you know, you're just abstracting different aspects and, and being able to get to those, the critical point of taking you down is only an hour. So that's a, another big thing as well. Um, looking back to move forward, uh, and this is about retrospectives, and I've heard you do retrospectives weekly, which is a great thing, but um, doing retrospectives all the time is definitely a commonality between all the companies. And 
really reviewing in detail changes that did cause a rollback, changes that did cause a bill to break, and really doing a deep dive technically about what caused that so it didn't continue to happen again. You know, definitely always been a, it's one of these that's always been a best practice, but continuous deployment seems to necessitate the use of the practice and using it often. Um, inviting PrivSec in, which is privacy and security. So this is kind of a, was a, a different aspect of the summit. And so a lot of the research I do now is in security, so I was interested in you know, finding out how do they handle changes that have security implications, changes that have privacy implications. And you know, say from my standpoint, it was kind of a, a turning point in, in the day to where the conversation was much more traditional. Um, so there, there was not a lot of innovation around how privacy and security were handled in the continuous deployment area. So in a lot of the cases, the company still had you know, the privacy experts or the security experts, and they were siloed, um, just like they were in, in other environments. Um, and they were not part of the team as a whole. You know, they, they were still off by themselves. Um, there were some, you know, some things that I'd say, um, you know, Facebook does have a slower process, so any, any changes that have privacy implications, because Facebook is always scrutinized about privacy, it had this path to go, and that was a much slower path than most of the changes. And so some companies had things like that. Um, API standards, and it was really the use of certain APIs. So if there were certain data implications, the only way to get to that data is you had to go through this this you know, component through this API. Um, that's a way to make sure that it was handled properly. A lot of controls on the deployment aspect, so the production server, the access to the production server, encryption on the production server. But all in all, I'd still say that privacy and security, there's a ways to go with continuous deployment to get that to be part of the big process. Um, still pretty much siloed. And then last adage is, ready or not, here it comes. Um, you know, your competitors continuously adding value, are you, is really the question to be asked. Um, people are doing it. Um, so there was a couple surveys, so one by um, CA Technologies, that 88% of executives say that they're moving in this direction over the next five years. It's a puppet survey that talked about continuous deployment having 60% fewer failures and 30 times more um, deploying 30 times more frequently. Um, so it's coming, you know, and then again, as me as an educator thinking about are, are we teaching the right things in the first place? You know, what, what are the new patterns? What do we need to get, be getting out there? All right, so that's the end of the adages. I'm going to go into some future directions on the next slide. But first, questions about any of them as you think back to what I talked about? Yeah. Yeah, so um, I, I would say we're not doing well in this environment. We're, we're not, you know, and that's, that's one of the reasons why. I mean, I've been in Agile for a long time, but it's definitely one of the reasons I'm like, wow, we better figure this out because we need to put students out that are ready to handle this, and, and a lot of the new things that are coming along are not being taught. Yeah. Um, you know, just from listening to the companies at the summit, I'm going to say there, there is some of both. So, like, the tooling people seem to be a separate group that are managing tooling and automation for the whole organization. But having deployment be part of everyone's consideration every day I means someone on the, in the team would need to be an expert in that as well. Other questions? Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I think that the burnout was more when 
they were, like, whatever code you ever wrote, you did take the call forever. And I, I think that the companies that managed it better did have this notion of shield team or rotation. And so I'll answer it for our, you know, I'm on call now, I'll answer it for our team um, was a better strategy. So, uh, based on similar notions, uh, what, what do these companies feel about board ownership? Like, because you are responsible for like one component, and that kind of adds to the stress. But if you feel like you, are, you own the board, like if the developers feel they own the board, then kind, kind of address the stresses that developers are having fair programming kind of enhances the board ownership across the team and don't feel as bad about it. Yeah, so uh, we, we did have a survey that we did as well, and we asked about code ownership, and um, they have code ownership. You know, they do. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, that we d I'm just going to say we did, we did not talk about that. Um, it's something that I wonder and, um, about, you know, to me, be, being a pair programming bigot myself, um, that that would help out, code, you know, people leaving. Um, but, but that people leaving was not something we talked about. Good question, though. But I do see pair programming as a risk mitigation strategy for that. Any other questions? Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah, I'm, I'm just about done. So um, some limitations and open questions. So one is um, it's not maybe not applicable for everyone. So safety cri critical applications, um, people who just, you know, insist on staying on-prem, you know, th those are kind of limitations. Um, but there are a lot of technical invitation, uh, um, innovations that need to take place as well. Um, new languages, telemetry patterns. I mean, I, I probably need to emphasize again that putting in the instrumentation, putting in this, you know, dark launches, feature flags, all of that, first of all, like it's among the things that we don't educate people to do, but we they need to do it and, and rip it out, you know, and so th those are the kinds of things that we need some more um, innovation about. And also uh, an open question is no tester, so no QA, which is one of the trends with continuous deployment as well. What's the impact about that, you know? people testing their own code. We don't really know. And to summarize, you know, all of this, lots of exciting changes, lots of challenges, lots of um, opportunities, and, you know, just to let you know, I'm, I'm a researcher. I want to research changes. You guys are doing a lot of innovative things here. Um, and as a researcher, I would love to work with anyone who might be interested in um, researching the kinds of things that you do. And so that's the end. Any other remaining questions? All right. Okay. Yeah. Um, do you have had an article recently about a big um, experiment that they did when they knew that they had to change um, the implementation essentially of Git? And they, I think that they um, ran everything through the existing um, the existing code flow, but then they also would run everything through the new version for six weeks or so and like dip them, but keep them, um, still show users the original version. Um, did any companies talk about doing things like that, where they were doing live experiments on prod without changing prod, if that makes sense? Yeah, they all did that. Definitely all did that. Yeah. Any other questions? All right. Well, thank you for your attention. And one more time, I'll be downstairs all day, and I would really love to talk to you. Questions are also just sharing with me your environment what you like about it, what you don't like about it. I mean, I would love to hear from you. So thanks again. Thank you, Laurie.